Hello, everyone. This is Dory Clark, and this is our Newsweek weekly interview show, Better. Our guest this week is Katie George. She's the chief people officer at McKinsey. Katie, it's great to have you here. Wonderful to be here, Dory. Excellent. All right. The first, the first question that I have for you out of the gate. So everybody's heard of McKinsey. This is uh, a kind of, you know, top tier consultancy. And the, the impression that maybe a lot of people have is that you're, you're just getting like the top cream of the cream from, uh, from all the Ivy league schools and, you do get that. But I understand that in terms of your diversity efforts, one of the things that you've been doing is actually being pretty thoughtful and systematic about expanding and changing the places that you're recruiting from. Can you talk a little bit about that and what that looks like? Absolutely. Um, we are very fortunate in that we continue to be a um, an employer that's sought out by a lot of wonderful um, students, you know, at many great schools. Um, and, uh, but we recognize that great talent comes from everywhere. Um, and that if we want to have the diversity of talent that we need to be successful with our clients, and I mean diversity on every different dimension, diversity of background and perspective, diversity of expertise and skill, um, we need to be hiring from a much broader range of sources. So we traditionally have focused on probably about 500 sources, 500 schools that have been our kind of primary feeders. Um, we're now at something like 1,500 and we plan to go to 5,000. Um, and we're quite excited about the results so far. Um, we're also supplementing that with um, more kind of apprenticeship programs, bringing people in who are ready to learn, but maybe not ready to hit the ground running as a McKinsey business analyst um, and really giving them the opportunity to apprentice and develop the skills they need to be successful. Interesting. Thank you very much, Katie. So the other thing that in my research that I discovered that I thought was interesting is that you guys have also changed the way that you interview people. Um, you can tell me more about this, but my understanding is you've gone from a sort of case style interview to game based assessments, which seems really interesting. What, what does that mean and what does that look like? Well, we use actually a, quite a broad range of assessment techniques. And so we still do have the McKinsey case study interview, which you can prepare for online if you, um, if you want to. Um, but we recognize, first of all, that that's not a great assessment um, for all of the talent that we're trying to bring into our firm. Um, so we do digital hackathons and lots of other things that allow us to assess, for example, technical talent. Um, but we also, to your point, have game-based systems and actually have brought a an organization in-house that um, is developing additional game-based assessments um, so that we can help people test their problem-solving skills and, and intrinsic capabilities um, in a way that is not based on understanding specific business language or being familiar with a case study format. Um, it is in that sense much less biased towards people who have certain kinds of preparation. Um, if you go to an Ivy League school, you can find lots and lots of friends who will help you study for the McKinsey case study interview. Um, and there'll be lots of support around that and you will be able to prepare. Um, if you are uh, at another school or in another, you know, working somewhere, you might not have access to the same kind of community and network. Um, and so we want you to have a fair shot of coming into our firm also because we are looking for the very best talent, not just the ones, uh, not just people who are able to prepare for these specific kinds of interviews. So that's really been um, a fantastic way to uh, diversify our sources and to um, create a platform that enables more people to be successful. Thank you. That's really interesting. We're here with Katie George. She's the Chief People Officer at McKinsey. And this is Dory Clark. This is our weekly Newsweek interview show, Better, talking about ways we can improve our organizations and make them truly more inclusive places. If you want to learn more about Katie's work and her team, uh, just go to mckinsey.com slash capabilities slash people dash and dash organizational dash performance. But you can also Google Katie George as well and find out all about the great work that she's doing. Now, Katie, one of the ways that we connected was through our mutual friend, uh, Bob, um, Bob Goodwin, who runs a podcast called Career Club. And on your Career Club interview, uh, you mentioned something interesting that I think ties in with some of the themes you've been mentioning, which is the value of assessing whether someone has the skills that an organization needs 
rather than just looking at the background that shows up on paper. Now, obviously, people look at uh, degrees, at credentials as as kind of a you know a, a heuristic, a shortcut, because it's yeah. it's kind of time consuming and a little complicated, I would imagine, to really assess skills, uh, even if that's the fairer thing to do. So how do you approach this? How can you actually get closer to that ideal um, when it's a tricky thing to do? Um, I think you're right that the number of years you've been in a role, what school you went to, in some ways, uh, sometimes those are markers of your capability and, and your potential, but sometimes they're not, um, and they're lazy markers. And so we are pivoting to much more of a skills basis and a skills credentialing kind of approach, both for how we welcome people into our firm and help them develop the kind of tailored learning and development journeys that will help them be successful based on their starting position, their unique starting position. Um, and also to allow them to self-author kind of the career path that they'd be most excited about. Um, there are lots of different ways to add value at McKinsey and as in other organizations. Um, and we want to create more flexibility for people to self-author um, the approach that would be best for them. Um, and we're finding that actually that's quite important in what is a very volatile business environment, a uh, very volatile world. We need to have a very dynamic approach to continuing to um, upskill and um, change the skills that we bring to our clients. And so using a skill architecture will be a way to create not only a more flexible and kind of employee centered approach, um, but also one that is more dynamic for us to continue to evolve to changing needs. Got it. Katie George, thank you. She's the people chief people officer at McKinsey. Now, Katie, something that that I'm curious about as well is how how we actually think about diversity, right? I mean, there's there's demographics that can be measured relatively easily, you know, what percentages of women or uh, people of different races. But how do you conceptualize diversity? And you know, what is your philosophy at at McKinsey thinking about you know all of the ways that this could potentially manifest? How do you think about it? How do you track it? Well, I think that um, diversity uh, uh, really should encapsulate diversity in all dimensions, right? Including um, how people approach problems, um, whether they're were introverted or extroverted, um, whether they have bring a kind of technical skill set and experience base and way of working uh, <clears throat> versus you know our more traditional uh, generalist you know problem solver consultant approach. So. Um, I think that d diversity really does go beyond kind of demographics uh, to um, really about how do we each uh, bring, you know, kind of our best selves to the work that we do and how do we create teams that effectively bring together uh, our diversity, not trying to have everybody fit into the same culture, but bring everybody together in a way, a culture that celebrates um, diversity and, and makes the most of it. You know, uh, one of the things our managing partner always talks about is that diversity only gets you so far. It's only with inclusion that you get the benefit of diversity. Um, and all of our studies have shown over and over again that the more diverse a team is, a management team, an organization, the more successful they will be, both from an organizational perspective and from a financial perspective. So diversity really is at the heart of our talent strategy. That's great. Katie George with McKinsey. Uh, this is Newsweek Better. I'm Dory Clark. So Katie, you and I were talking before we we hit the record button. You mentioned you you have really risen through the ranks at McKinsey. You've been there 27 years, I believe you said, which is really impressive. I have to believe that 27 years ago, it was probably, I'm guessing, more challenging to be a, a female employee than it is today. I'm curious, what changes have you personally seen or what have you experienced as a, as a woman at McKinsey, as a woman in business, and kind of what's, what's the arc of how you've seen things evolve over the past three decades? Well, I think you're right that um, uh, we have seen things evolve at McKinsey um, and uh, you're know, very proud of, of that evolution, of course. Um, although I, I also have to say that I um, feel very lucky. I was not the pioneer in terms of being one of the first senior women at McKinsey. There were others around me and before me who reached out with a hand and helped me um, to be successful, as did many of my male mentors and sponsors. Um, 
but there have been a lot of changes um, in our firm and they uh, include, you know, first of all, just many more role models um, who are women uh, at every, in every part of our firm. Lots of our office managers, our sector and function leaders uh, and, and the members of our board are, are women. So it's, it's a, we now have a significant number of senior partner women who are, by the way, a very tight knit kind of force within the firm, all advocating for uh, continued women's development and, and diversity in general um, and supporting each other. Um, so I think the notion of this network and the, just the numbers of women who've been successful certainly changes, changes things. But I think we've also made a real shift in our understanding um, that supporting women in our firm and making sure that we have representation at all levels of our firm um, both for women, but also other diverse groups, um, is not just a nice to have kind of social strategy, but is really fundamental to the business strategy, to our business success, to our, um, to our organizational success, to the success with our clients. And I think that's become a real shift, you know, over time that is manifest in how our leadership um, teams um, think about the importance of diversity, of their own role in accountability and diversity. We now, for example, for every single partner in our firm, for all 2000 partners, we measure how many people they are mentoring and sponsoring. And we also, and we measure, we, we note how many of those people are women and how many of them are diverse. And that is a statistic that goes into their annual review. Um, we look at that when we're making uh, decisions about who will be the next office managers or the next practice leaders. We look at the size of their kind of sponsor group and the diversity of it. Um, we look at how we are staffing teams and whether we're creating diverse teams over time and which, you know, which client serving teams are really creating diversity and which ones need some help to ensure that we are creating diversity. So it's very fundamental to how we think about success. We're not where we want to be. I don't want to suggest that we have completely cracked the code, but the mindset, the, you know, alignment on the um, uh, on the goal um, of equity um, and the rationale for that being um, a fundamental talent strategy is something that I think is now um, quite, has taken root and is shared. That's great. Katie George, Chief People Officer at McKinsey, and this is Newsweek Better. I'm Dory Clark. Now, Katie, you were recognized uh, recently in Forbes' inaugural Future of Work 50, which recognizes people who are shaping the future of work. Um, I am curious, one of the things that it seems like everybody in the HR talent space has had to talk about over the past few years is remote slash hybrid slash work from home and how that is impacting the workforce. I'd love to hear your thoughts about it. You know, how, how, are, how do you think about it? What's McKinsey doing? And also how do you feel like this factors into considerations around diversity, which, you know, some people um, believe it may have some overlay in that area as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think this is an exciting area and it's continuing to evolve. So nobody has kind of the final answers because we're still developing better technology um, for hybrid work. We're, we're evolving work processes and have micro habits. Um, you know, my belief based on data, um, because we measure what our teams do, how are they thinking about co-location? You know, how have they co-located? How often? Um, and then we look at the outcomes. Uh, what has driven attrition versus retention? What has driven excitement? We do a weekly pulse survey of all of our colleagues. How are you feeling? So we know how are the people feeling who've been co-located versus the people who have not. Um, what is our client feedback relative to those things? So we are very- What are you finding out? Studying. What we have found <laughs> is that there's a bit of a sweet spot around 50% co-location. Um, that, um, and that's not a- policy for every team to be together exactly two and a half days per week every week. Um, it's much more about how do we, um, uh, how does each team make decisions um, that balances personal needs, the different types of work that they're doing, what their clients are expecting and need uh, in order to create the right environment to do their work both collaboratively and independently. Um, and those teams that are finding a way to be co-located at least 50% of the time are getting to much better outcomes 
um, around the client feedback uh, and experience, around the excitement of the team members, around retention of our colleagues, um, and also interestingly around development. So when you ask um, each of our colleagues, which we do every year, how many mentors and sponsors do you have? People who are working mostly remotely have about the same number as the people who are working uh, co-located more often. However, the quality of the sponsorship, the opportunities for development are better when there's at least 50% co-location. However, when you increase the co-location beyond that, there's not a continued linear improvement in those statistics. And so what we're finding is that there really is a sweet spot about being together roughly 50% of the time, depends on the work and, and the nature of the work, et cetera. Um, but then really leveraging technology to drive the personal flexibility as well as um, kind of accommodate different types of work needs um, for the rest of that 50%. So, but one of the things that we're also seeing though is that this puts a lot more of an onus on the frontline manager to make good decisions um, about how to organize their team and their work um, and also to manage you know, productivity, um, which, you know, we used to do in a really lazy way by just seeing people work in front of us. So I do think that we're seeing, um, you know, much more of a push on how to develop our frontline leader skills, in our case, our team leader skills. Um, and I think we're seeing that in other organizations as well, because there's not a one size fits all answer. Um, the answer is somewhat nuanced and there is huge performance uplift on all different dimensions, people as well as kind of business performance for getting it right. That's great. Katie George of McKinsey, Chief People Officer. So Katie, one of the, the things that we do regularly with Better is every week we have our guest nominate a Better Leader of the Week. And this is someone who is doing on the ground work that is advancing in some capacity issues around diversity and inclusion. And your nominee, and I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit more about her and why you chose her, is Carolyn Pierce. Can you tell us about Carolyn? Yeah, Carolyn Pierce is a wonderful partner colleague uh, of mine. So partner at McKinsey, um, who has an interesting background herself. Um, she did not go to college. Um, so she's not some Ivy League degreed person at McKinsey, um, but has um, grown up through the firm very, very successfully as a partner and um, has really become a champion for the paper ceiling movement, both broadly in supporting our client organizations as well as um, you know other organizations around paper ceiling um, kind of movement, right? The movement as we talked about before from uh, you know, resumes and college degrees to really looking at skills and potential. Um, and it's been a real motivator and catalyst for us internally as well. So as we think about expanding our sources of, uh, of great talent, it's not just about expanding our sources of colleges to recruit from or business schools, uh, but also looking at um, colleagues or potential colleagues who don't have college degrees. I love that, that's great. Katie George, we have time for probably just one more question with you. And also before we hopped on this call, one of the, the commonalities that uh, that we discussed, uh, you are a former board member of Union Theological Seminary. I uh, got a master's degree at Harvard Divinity School. And one of the things that you mentioned in terms of the sort of broad focus around diversity of all kinds is that you have been involved in, and McKinsey has uh, some multi-faith groups at, uh, at the organization. I'd love to hear more about that and how you think about um, you know, sort of multi-faith or interfaith efforts as part of the mission around diversity. Um, well, I think, I think multi-faith for me has um, been really um, rich and kind of fulfilling way to build community um, in McKinsey. Um, we had a multi-faith group in our office for a while. Right now, um, uh, there's several of my fellow board meeting meet members and I who, who meet regularly um, and talk about our faith and from very different faith traditions. Um, so I think it's been, for me, a, an important kind of personal way of building community and continuing a journey as a person of faith, trying to live my faith through my work. Um, but it's also, I think, such an important um, way of bringing communities together in this world that feels increasingly fractured and um, at odds with each other. And 
Um, I'll tell you when, you know, you have a conversation with people from different parts of the world with different faith backgrounds and find that really you have so much in common as to what your aspirations are for how the world should work, how people should be treated with justice and compassion um, and how, you know, all of these colleagues are trying to live that mission into the way that they lead in the jobs that they do. Um, it just brings us together more. And I, I think that, um, you know, corporations and, and certainly McKinsey can be glue across our fractious world because we have a common working culture um, and a common set of values um, and um, being purposeful about creating glue across what otherwise can be very divisive, um, you know, kind of cracks uh, in our world is, is, is something that we can do um, through, our, through our work lives. That's terrific. This is Dory Clark, and this is our weekly Newsweek interview show, Better. If you want to never miss an episode, you can go to doryclark.com, download a self-assessment. You will be added to the email list to get reminders about wonderful shows like this. And we have been here with our guest for the week, Katie George. She is the Chief People Officer at McKinsey. Katie, it's such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you all, and see you next week.